The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Bill Brayton, ATRA Senior Research Technician, welcoming you to another ATRA webinar, lunchtime webinar. Uh, today's project, uh, today's webinar is on the Ford CFT30 rebuild information. First, let's take care of uh, the business end of things. We want to uh, talk about your connection. Make sure that you are on a hardwired connection. Uh, we'd hate to see your Wi-Fi drop out uh, on a streaming presentation like this. <clears throat> you should have the handout by now. If you do not, uh, please send a uh, shoot an email out to webinar, webinars at atra.com, and we'll get you uh, handled straight away. Or you can type in the link up there on your screen and uh, grab the grab grab it off of our website also if you have any questions uh, feel free to uh, write it up in the question box on your screen there and uh, I will get your questions answered if I don't know the answer I will get back to you uh, with uh, I'll research it and get back to you and finally there's a survey at the, that you'll receive at the end of the conclusion of today's seminar. So please feel free to uh, fill that out, take some time and fill that out, and uh, let us know uh, how we did today. Today's presentation is sponsored by Seal Aftermarket Products, your source for engineered solutions. And here is a short video for you guys. Seal Aftermarket Products. Engineers and manufacturers, Toledo Transkit, the most trusted and complete kit for 25 years. Toledo Transkit gives you more critical components, more OE components, like premium seals and gaskets, more design enhancements, patented components, and all the little extras you won't find elsewhere. At Seal Aftermarket Products, we don't just make kits, we make kits better. Toledo Transkit is the number one choice of installers because of all the intensive research and development that goes into each component in every kit. Like re-engineered valve body gaskets, preventing EPC damage by eliminating the shredding you get from original equipment. Plus, all of the extra essentials that are included, like spring and screen filters that should be changed at overhaul. Toledo Transkit even includes loose valve body gaskets that fit all 19 bonded separator plates. When servicing Honda and Acura transmissions, shaft nuts are quite often damaged during removal. Toledo Transkit provides all the main shaft, secondary shaft, and counter shaft nuts so you don't have to try to reuse the originals or pay extra for them at the dealer. Honda Acura kits also include valve body screen filters, pressure tap washer, and other important components like bolt locks, roll pins, and pistons. What you get is a complete kit with great fit and no wasted time or worry about ordering extra parts. If you want the best ceiling transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Trans Kit by name. Okay, let's continue on. Also, we'd like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors, Whatever It Takes Transmission Parts, and my favorite transmission rebuilding industry publication, Gears Magazine. If you have any questions, or feel free to contact Lance Wiggins at ATRA. That's lwiggins at atra.com. Our webinar schedule is up in front of you here. We've got two a month, three in September, throughout the summertime, all the way into October. So we have many, many opportunities for training for uh, you guys out there. So be sure you tune in. Reminder that Expo is coming up uh, here in October and November. It's four days this year. So be sure and pencil it in on your calendar. 
it's uh, at the Rio Hotel and Casino again this year. So uh, we're in a bigger room, nice facility, four days of tech and management. So uh, make plans to be there. Also, we are giving away at your local Saturday seminars, one lucky attendee will receive a free expo package. That's four nights hotel, uh, a complete conference registration for the tech, for the management, for the cocktail parties, for the luncheons. I mean, this is just a killer giveaway. So. Uh, and the only thing you need to do is get yourself to Vegas and uh, be able to attend the uh, free expo. Just be there at the Saturday uh, seminar in your area. All right. Enough with the business. Let's get on to it. My reason why we're here is to talk about the CF30, CF, <laughs> CFT30 uh Rebuild highlights. I, I covered uh, in a previous CFT 30 uh, webinar, we talked about valve bodies and some problems that the units were having. Well, this time we're going to highlight some of the rebuild procedures. We're not going to cover the complete rebuild. That would be too long and quite frankly too boring, but we're going to hit some of the highlights here and a lot of uh, the major, major highlight with this unit is special tools. Uh, we all, and I've, I've said this in the past and I'll say it again, that, that you know, we can pretty much take apart and put back together anything. I mean, that's, that's what we do. But uh, with this unit, the use of the special tools is going to make it a lot easier and a lot quicker. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is this socket and what I'm going to call a retainer. It fits uh, the output shaft nuts, uh, the drive and driven shaft nuts, I should say. And it basically what it is is a 50 millimeter 12 point socket. But when it's, what it has here is this retainer that bolts to the case because this nut takes 370 foot pounds of torque. And so we're going to need either a three-quarter inch drive uh, torque wrench or a torque multiplier to get that kind of torque going on this nut. And on top of that, you probably have to find some place to bolt it to the floor so, uh, so it's secure in getting that kind of torque on that bolt. So it's definitely necessary to have that large socket and retainer set up there. Uh, the case connector doesn't pull straight out. Disconnect the, uh, un unbolt the retaining bolt and uh, rotate it counterclockwise about a quarter of a turn and then it pulls straight out so we can remove the valve body. The speed sensor has a spacer that needs to stay with the speed sensor. Should you not pay attention, if you're not paying attention, this will drop out. And we don't want to lose that because if you put that, that speed sensor back in there uh, it will, and try to run the bolt down, it will break it immediately. So you have to have that 226 spacer in there. I would recommend uh, using some mechanics wire and wiring it right to the sensor as the sensor comes up and out of the case. Prior to splitting the case, we want to remove the tubes here. Uh, these three on the left are all the same size. It doesn't matter which hole they go into. The bonded double tubes here are disposable. These tubes come in the rebuild kit, uh, so we don't have to worry about uh, say, holding on to those. Those can come out and go right into the trash. And this tube right here feeds the uh, manual valve body and it has an o-ring up inside where it seals on this pipe that you can see down in the case so it's very important that when we are servicing this pipe that we change uh, both o-rings on the tube there okay these are uh, here we're going to remove the case bolts 
you can see we've already got the transfer shaft out of the case. One thing that is worth noting is this bear, this caged bearing right here may not stay in the race in the case. So you want to uh, make sure that you handle that carefully and not knock out any of the rollers out of the cage. Don't want any of that stuff to get lost. Uh, so be careful when you pull this transfer shaft and uh, take care that the, if the caged roller comes out with it to uh, carefully set that aside. The pump to case seal plate does not have to come out at this time. Uh, this, is, this will be serviced uh, when we work on the bell housing on the subassemblies. That uh, this comes out by this is removed by simply taking these three Torx bolts out. And on this particular one, this is the new one. I had to punch a hole in this one to get it pried up and out of there to remove the uh, to remove the pump. Okay, so let's uh, take a look here. We've got the cases split couple areas to inspect here. The bearing surface on the input shaft, that is a very high failure area. The bearing in the bell housing tends to pit and will wear out the input shaft. So you will need to replace the input shaft and the planetary gear set to all one piece. And this will, what you will hear if you this car comes in with a complaint of a noise in park and neutral and goes away when you put it in in gear reverse drive doesn't matter it stops as soon as you put it in gear that's your issue in this area right here always carefully inspect this Torrington bearing on the drive shaft this is going to be the drive shaft. This is going to be the driven shaft. If I've seen this bearing, this uh, needle bearing here, catastrophically fail on more than one instance, so uh, it's a good idea if you see any pitting at all to replace the Torrington and the planetary where it rides inside here. Uh, when that fails, it takes out the sun gear the planet and the ring gear uh, really does a number when uh, those worn out rollers get in between the teeth of those planetary gear sets. Removing the forward clutch pretty straightforward but what we want to pay attention here to is uh, these two O-rings. If you have a delayed engagement or slips on takeoff uh, we've seen these O-rings deteriorate and chew up, so that you want to pay close attention to that area so that we can correct that. If the rest of the, if, if you do have one of these units that comes in with a delayed engagement and slips on takeoff, it's fairly easy to get the transmission to this point without any special tools. You can break apart, you can break off the bell housing, you can uh, get the snap ring and so forth off. If the clutches look good, the rest of the, you take a look down in and the pulleys and the chain looks good, I have no problem with making, a, it's, a, it's a good repair to change these to new O-rings and reassemble and reseal the bell housing. Uh, I've seen more than one shop do this with, with uh, and have it be an effective repair. Okay, so here we have the manual valve body components. This is down inside the case. It's a separate body from the main control body. It has a, another disposable pipe here that fits into the bell housing uh, with, from, that connects from the manual valve body to the bell housing. Uh, we've got a couple of shoulder to Torx bolts uh, to attach the de detent spring to the case and of course the electronic Hall Effect MLP. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's see here. We want to split that apart to clean up and service the check valves. Make sure we uh, change the O-rings 
as part of our service. They simply push up and out of this cover and uh, change the O-rings here and make sure that we've got good spring tension on the check valves. Okay, here is the main part of the special tools that we will need. The holding fixture, the crossbar, and the setups to remove the case and install the case onto the uh, onto the chain and pulleys. It's important to note right here that you have a O-ring here on this holding fixture. This protects the seal surface. Want to be sure and lubricate that before we install it onto the the uh, pulleys. So what it looks like being installed onto the pulleys here. Uh, they've got all the other major components out of the case, so we can put this on to the pulleys and flip it over. But you might need to tap on that with a fiber hammer to get it down onto fully seated onto the pulleys. The, like I said earlier, it's possible to remove the variators from the chains. I've done it. Put it on the press and press each shaft out, support the case, press each shaft out a little bit at a time. It, it, uh, it, it's really worth your time spent to search the Internet. These, these tools I found uh, on eBay for, I think, $200, $250, really quite a good deal. The socket was, I believe, 90 bucks. I, I got it on Amazon or eBay, one or the other. I can't remember at this time. So, and there again, it just makes, you know, you know when you have the right tools, it makes the job easy. When the job's easy, it goes fast, goes right. So, a good practice here is on the short uh, crossbar supports that screw into the case, it's a good idea to clean up these threads with a tap before you screw these in because there's a fairly heavy residue of Loctite uh, in these bolt holes where uh, a mount attaches to. If you do not do that, what you'll end up doing is, is really having to force this thing down into these threads and it'll take a pair of pliers and just cause a bunch of extra work that uh, you really don't need. So. Uh, take the time to tap out the threads, and those will, those supports will turn in uh, by hand. They only need to be just bottomed out uh, on next to the aluminum to work effectively. Now we're going to put the mandrels on the the small one goes on the short, the long one goes on. I mean, the short one go <laughs> the short mandrel goes on the drive shaft while the long goes on the driven shaft. Okay, crossbar on top of the supports. These bolts right here, again, only need to be hand tight. You don't need to run these down with the impact. It's going to add longevity to the tool. And finally, screw the put the screws into the crossbar and pull the case off of the shafts. Never use an air tool. This uh, doesn't take. Uh, this isn't a long process with the ratchet. You want to turn each one of those screws in about a quarter of a turn at a time to lift the case off of the shafts evenly. Okay, here we have a look at the shafts of the case off. Fit nicely in the tool. Here we have a compressor tool. This tool has a, a lip here. It's a little difficult to see in this picture. It goes all the way around the horseshoe-shaped tool. Fits into a groove just underneath the pulley lip right here. So here we've got the pulley installed. This is another area that you do not want to use a power tool. Uh, very light pressure to with a 3 h drive ratchet to get this to open up the pulley. Now we've got a loose chain. While the chain's loose, it's a good idea to remove the chain guides. We've got 
uh, a chain guide on both sides, one facing us and one facing away from us. Very easy to split these in two and set them aside for cleaning. There's a purpose-built groove in this tool right here. This is spline to match the splines on the shaft. We just pull this over, lift it up, and pull it over. This sits quite nicely in here. We can use both hands to work the chain down out of the pulley. You can see that, that the tool fits this uh, bearing journal right here, and it supports it pretty nice so you get the chain out of there with both hands. This is a used chain. It's not a good idea to let a new chain hang like this. So when we're going back together with the assembly, we can pull, put, the tool, put the chain and rest it right on this post right here without hanging down on its own weight. The thing to note here is that the splines hold the shaft so that when we go back together with it and we put our 50 millimeter socket on there, this is, this, is, this is going to be a part of the case when we're putting all that torque on the, unit, on the shaft. This, these splines are what holds that shaft from turning. I was talking to a guy yesterday, he had a question, and he says, well, well, uh, I wasn't able to get uh, 350 pounds or 370 pounds of torque on it because at, at 200, when this is all at rest, he said, I put 200 foot-pounds of torque on this, and it was actually turning through the spring tension and causing it to slip on the chain. Well... It makes sense because he didn't have the holding fixture on it. So you absolutely have to have the holding fixture on this to get that kind of torque number on that nut. Here's a good look at the chain and its wear points. This chain is not uh, the traditional type of sprocket chain assembly uh, that we've seen in transmissions past, but the chain rides on the post. Uh, in between the links here. And you could see here that the posts have worn to the shape of the pulley because that's, that's how it, the CVT function and gets its various ratios is that the chain moves up and down in the pulley. As the pulley expands and contracts, it moves up and down changing the ratios constantly. So these are the contact points for this chain. So that uh, most every one of these chains, I, I honestly, I think every chain gets replaced. It's a throwaway item. You can buy these parts online. Simply uh, Google CFT30. There's a couple of guys out there that have parts for these. Uh, and you can have these parts within a few days. So the parts are, are pretty accessible as far as that goes. Okay, here's the driven pulley inspection. Okay, I've seen articles online. I've seen one, I should say, one article online on how a guy wrote and how he drilled out these swedges right here. This is what this is the seal area right here. There's a very large spring in here. And what he was able to do was drill out these swedges, first starting off uh, with a smaller size drill, going up to a bigger size drill, and then finally going to a drill that's been ground flat that just fits inside of this hole right here to uh, eat away at this metal. And do that all the way around. And I could see five here. I think there's nine or ten of these swedges all the way around the circumference of this housing. I tried it and had very little success doing it. The idea was to remove this housing, to remove the spring, to clean up uh, the in internal part of the piston housing. That's what this is. And I, I just, uh, I didn't have any luck, so I'm not going to recommend doing that. If there's a problem, there, there, 
if there's a problem in here, the whole thing's going to get replaced. The rebuild kit did not come with the uh, seals for this unit. It comes with other se other piston seals, but not for the driven pulley section. So uh, there really wasn't much to taking it apart other than cleaning it up. The seals are pretty durable in these things. Uh, what we can do is install the end cover onto the shaft and air check for leaks. What we're listening for is any kind of blow-by inside this drum or at this seal. You won't, uh, even if you have 140 to 160 foot-pounds of pressure, or foot-pounds, pounds per square inch in your shop air system, it still won't move this. There is a big spring inside of here. And these units these units run anywhere from 250 to 850 PSI, so it takes a, a pretty fair amount of pressure to move these pistons right here. So the main function of air checking is to uh, observe the integrity of the seals. Now the drive shaft we can take apart. We can. We can take apart and, and change the seals on, on the uh, piston here and inner and outer seals here. To do that, we separate the, uh, we uh, support the drive shaft with a bearing spreader here and press the retainer off of the shaft. The thing you have to watch out for is that this, when we we do this operation, it compresses this return spring and this return spring here. So when you get close to pressing the retainer all the way out, uh, it's probably a good idea to put a blanket underneath here or a fender cover underneath here if it goes through here. It's going gonna, it's gonna to going to release from that press fit and those springs are going to launch this shaft uh, out of here. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to uh, make sure that you have something underneath the press here so uh, you avoid damaging anything or your toes. Be very careful about that. So now we've got the housing over on the bench, and we can take off the retainer sleeve with a couple of pry bars. Uh, that fits that it, that fits down on this shoulder right here. It's not a very tight press fit, so it pops up and off of there fairly easy. And then we can return get the return spring out of there. Notice that it's dished down. And the piston comes out of there quite easily. Uh, the thing I want you to see here on this picture is the square edge right here along the inside of this bore. It looks like it looks like with this shading here and over here that this is tapered or chamfered. <clears throat> it's not. It's not. It's uh, this is a, a very square edge. There's a slight edge here uh, that has that is friendly to the inner seal here. But when we change these seals, this is where it becomes problematic. These seals have a large O-ring back in behind them, both on the inside, inner and outer uh, seal area. And if you were to look at a cross-section, this is a Teflon ring. And if you were to look at a cross-section of this Teflon ring, it would look like a channel steel. It's got a channel running down the middle of it where it fits onto this O-ring, both the inner and outer. So makes for a pretty beefy seal. And when I was coming up, after I changed the seals on this, I was trying to figure out a way to get, because there was no way a feeler gauge was going to fit and compress this big aluminum, a big Teflon seal. So I went to uh, the local hardware store and got a couple of uh, I've got a couple of big duct hose clamps, put them together. This thing's, this thing's oh, probably about six inches across, 
six inches across, too small for a uh, uh, too small for a uh, pump pump uh, alignment tool type of thing that I was thinking that we were going to use, and that didn't work. And finally, uh, went down to a uh, local parts to parts store and got a very large uh, piston ring compressing tool. So this we were able to. This was much more user friendly. The hose clamps would tend to dig into the Teflon which uh, was not very user-friendly. I hate to put dents and, and whatnot into Teflon like that as well, as I think that maybe over time those dents would work their way out of it. I just um, wasn't thinking that that was such a hot idea to, to do. So we went down and got this spring compressing tool, and once you lubricate it, once you lubricate the seal up and the tool up, it was much easier. It was still tricky. But it was still manageable to the point where, with even pressure all the way around on this, we could get it to pop into the housing. So uh, that is definitely a necessary tool for this unit. That's one of the cheaper tools. Now that we've got it in there, we want it to stay in there. So we're going to uh, put the retainer back on, first the, the return spring dish down, then the retainer. We can just lightly tap this down onto the housing. goes just past flush. You can see this ledge right here is where it protrudes up. That's totally proper. Now we're going to go back with our Belleville spring and then lastly drive the retainer back onto it. And that's taking apart the drive shaft. So we need to put it back on, put the case back onto the shafts. Here we've got our shafts fully assembled. We've got the guides back on, both front and back guides here. Simply put the case down on it. And there again, I say, pressing a case back onto the shafts can be done without the special tools. But what you're doing is more than likely you would support the case and press the shaft down in one at a time, just little by little. It's, uh, as I said before, it can be done, but it's just not easy. This way, we put the, put the posts on the base, put the crossbar on, secure it with the nuts and the spacers. Take the drivers, these fit onto the bearings and are pushing, we're going to be pushing on the bearings themselves so that we press the case down quarter of a turn at a time with the ratchet. Never an air tool. This way we pull the case, push the case down onto the shafts uh, one, one quarter of a turn at a time evenly. It's a, and once it stops, you can see it bottoms out right here on the tool. That's fully seated down onto the bearings. The bearings are fully, I should say the bearings are fully seated down onto the shafts. Okay, this was uh, something I ran across as I was assembling this unit. Uh, not a good idea to put the seal in first while you're servicing the case assembly. Leave the seal out. I had a pretty hard time getting this through without damaging the seal. Uh, so my recommendation here is to leave this seal out until after the case halves are put back together and you're able to flip the unit over while you're working on the nuts and end covers to put the seal down in over the differential and drive it into the case. It keeps it from tearing the seals and preventing a comeback. Okay, here we got the front pump. There are no books that I know of, uh, no factory books that show the blow part of the pump, but and the pumps are having problems. They are breaking the springs. You might uh, get a complaint of a cracked flywheel type of noise that gets louder as you stall it up. We found that that's the noise that the plunger springs make. So we had to come up with a way to take this pump apart is that uh, those are pretty heavy duty springs pushing in on this inner ring here. We've got a snap ring, a washer, 
Uh, this is the pump drive. It splines into the converter and a couple of support rings here. And we're going to pull the inner ring out uh, a little bit at a time. And once it once it finally comes out, these uh, springs tend to bounce all over the place. So do not do that over a hole in the bench because you'll start losing parts. A 4L60E pump slide return spring is a perfect replacement for this unit. Uh, it's it's a touch shorter. I mean, just maybe 10,000 shorter. It's the the, the same same uh, diameter, and the wire sizes are almost identical. So a 4L60E, if you do have a pump spring, because individual pump parts are not sold separately, uh, that's why the 4L60E is a good replacement. Now getting that back together was uh, a bit of a challenge. So I uh, just kind of figured out what we could do here and went down to my local Harbor Freight store and picked up eight three-inch C-clamps and modified them with a cutting wheel. Took off the arch right here, the support arch, and flattened it out and also ground the sides down so I'd have room for all eight of them here and was able to compress the spring such that I could get this pump ring back in quite easily. Now, <clears throat> this was a trial and error type of thing uh, to get these to fit in here. Uh, and these things are pretty flimsy, quite frankly. They're pop metal. And so the problem was cutting these too thin right here you could not put too much pressure on here or these would crack. So you had to leave it a little bit thicker right here so they wouldn't crack. But, uh, you know, in, in here's the thing. If you're going to do a lot of these, I know some shops are. Uh, one of the guys back east I talked to, he's seeing three of these a month. And uh, if you're doing a lot of these, you might want to go to a, uh, like a heavier steel C-clamp that's going to be much stronger and not a pot metal $2 C-clamp like this one. But uh, this is just for illustration purposes. And we screw the, unscrew these and pull these out and it all snaps into place and you're done. So uh, I believe, yep, in closing that these aren't bad units to do. There are parts available as long as you're set up with the tooling. The tooling is available uh, out there on the Internet. Just have to keep your eye out for it. Parts are available. Kits are available. Converters are available. So there's no reason to uh, turn these away as long as you have the special tools. That being said, uh, if there's any questions or comments from the attendees, uh, please feel free to type them in the question box while I do the outro here, and uh, we'll wrap things up. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to our co-sponsors, Whatever It Takes Transmission Parts, and my favorite publication, Gears Magazine, for the transmission rebuilding industry. I would also like to thank uh, today's title sponsor, Seal Aftermarket Products. Uh, your source for engineered solutions. And thank you all for attending. And it looks like uh, we don't have any questions out there. Okay. Is there a link to rewatch this training, Ken Armstrong asked? Yes, there is, Ken. And that link should be up tomorrow. I don't think it's up until this afternoon after the um, all the seminars, all the webinars are taken care of, and this is the last one out of the series, uh, out of all the different time zones, I should say. Uh, so yes, if it's not up today, uh, it'll be up within the next day or so. So it will be there for you guys to rewatch. Uh, any other questions out there? Okay, well, uh, i just like to say my name's Bill Brayton. 
Thank you for attending, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.